It's like we have the CJ, WHAS radio, and TV, WLKY, and WFPL. Good morning and welcome to our COVID-19 press briefing. Today is Tuesday, November 9th, 2021, and this is Kathy Turner, Director of Communications for the Department of Public Health and Wellness. Dr. Sarah Beth Hartledge, Associate Medical Director for the Department of Public Health and Wellness is your host today. Joining her are Connie Mendel, Assistant Director of the Department of Public Health and Wellness. Dr. Beverly Gaines, pediatrician and founder of Beverly Gaines and Associates, and Tonya Myers, an advanced practice family nurse practitioner from the Family Health Center's Iroquois. I'd just like to remind everyone to please mute your devices and place your questions in the chat addressed to everyone. Dr. Hartledge, I'll now turn things over to you. Thank you, Kathy, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we were super excited last week to uh, discuss the final approval for um, Pfizer's vaccination against COVID for children ages 5 to 11. Uh, I've certainly spent a lot of time reviewing the clinical trial data, as I'm sure um, Dr. Gaines and Tonya have as well. Um, and this uh, vaccine is really impressive. The um, efficacy is quite high. The side effects are low. Um, it's a great combination, and we are going to talk a little bit more about the vaccines for children age 5 to 11 in a few minutes. But first, um, let's do our standard review of our COVID data. Um, so, I have the uh, unfortunate task of reporting that we are back in the red zone today with an incidence rate of 31, 000, uh, 31 cases per 100,000 of the population. Uh, we saw a new case rate of six, 1,662 new cases last week and 13 new deaths. Um, it's not an enormous change from previous, but it, it has kind of bounced up and down a little bit and headed, unfortunately, back up for the last couple of days. Um, you can see the tail on the graph there pointing up. Let's go on down to the vaccine dashboard. Um, we have given uh, almost one and a half million total doses across the area. Uh, we have 58% of our population that has completed their vaccine series, 66% that has had at least one dose. If you look at the colored dots here on the right, the um, orange ones are first doses, the blue ones are second doses, um, and the bright green is for uh, third doses or boosters. And if you um, look Around July, we had kind of an increase back up of our first and second doses with the Delta surge. And then um, over the last, uh, since about September, we've seen our uh, booster numbers go up uh, significantly. Uh, since the approval uh, last week of uh, Pfizer doses for ages 5 to 11, uh, we have seen 888 children in that uh, demographic group be vaccinated uh, as well. Our um, hospitalization rates have trended down slowly. Um, it remains to be seen if we'll see an, an uptick uh, with our case numbers going back up a little bit. So um, just remember, it takes no time at all for the numbers to go up, and it takes a very long time for them to trail back down. Um, ICU numbers and ventilator utilization, again, are relatively flat. It's taking some time uh, to extend uh, and get those numbers back to where they were before the Delta surge. All right, um, so uh, I, yesterday we, as the Department of Public Health and Wellness, um, in partnership with Smoketown Family Wellness and support from the Kentucky Nurses Association, uh, we had our first vaccine event where we, we were able to uh, vaccinate children age 5 to 11 uh, last night. I know uh, Norton Healthcare has also been um, delivering doses to that age group as well um, as some other providers in the area. Um, last night was a great event. We gave 122 vaccine doses, including 86 for children in the newly approved group. 
Um, and, you know, I am a physician, but really my most important job is um, as a mom and my husband and I both believe um, very strongly in the science and in the data um, that says that these COVID vaccines are safe and effective for children. So uh, I was happy to get my six year old vaccinated last night. It, uh, it's a real relief for us. Uh, to know that um, I've done everything I can to try and protect her, um, especially as we look toward the holidays and uh, being able to visit with our family safely. Um, so as we talk some more about uh, children and their vaccine outlook, um, joining me now is uh, Dr. Beverly Gaines, a well-known uh, pediatrician in the area, and um, Sonia Myers, who is a family nurse practitioner uh, working uh, at Family Health Center in Iroquois. So um, thank you both for joining me today. And um, I guess I'm gonna start with Dr. Gaines. You signed on early to uh, be a COVID vaccine provider. And I know you've been vaccinating um, both adults and adolescents um, in your clinic, regardless of whether they're your patient or, um, or someone else. So uh, can you just talk a little bit about how the vaccine efforts have gone in your office and um, what progress you feel um, you've made overall? Dr. Gaines, I think you're still muted. So sorry. Uh, we started um, giving the COVID vaccine um, in April. And uh, to date, I think we've given over 600 doses. We're not a mega site, but you know we're making progress. Now, last Saturday, we were at um, Midwest uh, Church of Christ, and we did 70. And that was phenomenal. And I think the only other number we I remember uh, similar to that was when we did the event at the park, at Chickasaw Park with NAACP. That was over 70. But now, I won't say we're going gangbusters, uh, and I won't say that everybody uh, is like okay put it in my arm some are but not everybody and but i'll tell you what something more concerning is that i'm getting more resistance with flu vaccine because we offer them at the same time and more people don't want the flu and they take the COVID. so i'm not exactly sure you know what's going on in everybody's mind out there but uh, i think we're doing good and we're doing steady we go out into the community and then we give them every day here, including Saturday at the office by appointment. Uh, and I'm, I think we're doing fairly well. We've got a slow start, of course, just getting all the procedures down. But now we're sort of ramping up and our events are uh, uh, much more successful. I was really happy with last Saturday. Yeah, that's great. I know um, our experience with our mobile vaccinations and standing sites have, has been the same way that uh, the you typically see smaller numbers. Um, it's, it's more of a personal interaction and, and things like that. We're, unfortunately, the days of getting a couple thousand in a drive through are, are behind us. So, um, yeah. tell me, I know at Family Health Centers, you all have been providing vaccines. Uh, can you comment on uh, how the vaccination efforts are going um, over there? So we have also been offering uh, vaccines uh, to those 12 and up for several months now. And we have walk-in appointments available at our East Broadway as well as our Portland sites. And at Portland, we also have uh, walk-in appointments on Saturdays. So we have seen a steady trickle of people coming in uh, to receive their vaccines. And um, you know, we are also have had a few appointments at some community areas offering vaccines. Um, so we're just uh, steadily uh, offering the vaccines, talking to people when they come in for their appointments about the vaccines. Uh, even though I see primarily uh, pe um, pediatric patients, we still also uh, talk to the parents about getting vaccines as well. And um, Sonia, do you, does Family Health Centers uh, vaccinate children under 12? And do they have to be your patients to get a vaccine for your kids? So, Anyone over the age of 12 can get a vaccine at family health centers, and that's during our walk in appointments, as I previously mentioned. This week, uh, we are excited to start offering vaccines to children uh, ages uh, 5 to 11. And uh, for now, we're limiting the vaccines to the, our patients. So we'll be offering them during regular appointments and also to our patients on Saturdays for, during walk ins. 
Um, so we're limiting the vaccines to our, to our patients, as well as the staff, the children of our staff members and contractors. And that's primarily because of uh, staff limitations. So we're really excited for the community partners that are, have been having um, clinics, vaccine clinics in the community. Great, thank you. Um, so I know that you know, the American Academy of Pediatricians and the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, and many other uh, professional groups have heartily endorsed, endorsed this vaccine. Um, what is the biggest reason, uh, Dr. Gaines, do you think that uh, they and, and you, I guess, are um, endorsing this vaccine, recommending it for small children? They're on mute, Dr. Gaines. Sorry, <laughs> like you said earlier, I think we're all comfortable with the vaccine because of the profile, the safety, the efficacy, uh, the lack of adverse events. Uh, and I've not had anybody to have uh, anything more than a little sore arm uh, that, I, that has been reported to me. Uh, so I think that's why we are uh, happy to embrace it. And uh, in the paper yesterday, I read that we, did we make a mark of 10, we lost 10,000 people and the governor's going to have, he's going to commit a memorial to those lost to COVID. Was it 10,000 or was it, it wasn't a million. It was, I think, 10,000 uh, deaths. And uh, I was happy to hear that. And I think efforts like that by the establishment will encourage people to get vaccinated and maybe help them change their mind. Yeah, I agree. I think um, the trial for, for the pediatric data, especially, is about the cleanest trial I've ever seen. Uh, mm -hmm. You really couldn't ask for better results in their trial than, than they had. Um, a recent study, not the vaccine trial, but a separate study recently showed that vaccine hesitancy is higher among certain groups of parents, um, with about one quarter of white parents expressing hesitancy for COVID vaccines, uh, one quarter of white parents, one third of Hispanic parents, and up to half of um, black parents. Um, what have either one of you been able to say or do to um, interact with those parents that have those concerns? How do you ease those concerns um, about getting their themselves or their kids uh, vaccinated? Um, Sonia, you can go first. Sonia? So Okay. Vaccine hesitancy is always a complex issue, you know, um, sometimes it's not always related to fears about the vaccine itself. You know, we've had had some parents that are worried about the getting sick after the vaccine uh, or their child getting sick and then they're having to miss work. So we do a lot of reassuring. We always first want to let our parents know that the vaccines are safe and that um, we are ready to answer any questions or concerns that they have. Um, we have family health centers. We have uh, multiple interpreters available to answer questions about the vaccines in any language. And we do have some parents that are also very excited, you know, about the vaccine, been looking forward to it. I have had a few parents ask me, you know, so is it, do you have the vaccine yet? And I even had one mom tell me that she, her five year old told her that he was ready to get the vaccine because he was ready to be done with masks. So. But a reassurance, of course, is always the, the key. And Dr. Gaines, what do you say to a parent who's concerned? Well, I always reassure them that even racially, there's no uh, difference in the side effects and the profiles and, uh, and the safety. Uh, I think that African-Americans, uh, who I see the majority of my patients are African-American, we have a long history of um, health disparities. And whereas if one population gets a cold, we get pneumonia. I don't think it has anything, I won't say nothing to do. I discouraged people talking about the Tuskegee um, research that was done. And I tried to explain to them about how the FDA and all the, uh, the CDC, the advisory panels, they're all put in place to make sure nothing uh, untoward happens to any one population. And, and then, of course, you'll say, well, you know, if I had an 11-year-old, I would immunize my 11-year-old. And just like I did when, you know, they didn't want the hepatitis or they didn't want the uh, Prevnar, I'd say, well, my kids are getting it. And I always just reassure them that way because I, 
you know, with even when I go to the doctor, a lot of times I'll say, they'll say, well, we could do this, we could do that. I said, well, what would you do if it was your mother? You know, when you can bring it home and bring it personal, it seems to have maybe a, a, a more powerful effect. Yeah, I think uh, leading by example that way is really important. I know um, there is a group of uh, physician moms in town, and uh, I've seen a lot of excitement from that group. <laughs> uh, excited to get their kids vaccinated, um, and I feel the same way. Uh, so uh, thank you both for joining us, and uh, I ask that you hang on. We'll probably have some questions for you in a few minutes. Um, I do want to remind parents that there are several opportunities and places to get your children vaccinated. Um, we're showing here a live look at uh, the vaccines.gov, and um, you can see, you can just put in your zip code and it will pop up and show you um, all the sites that you want to uh, look at. And you can also um, sort by vaccine type if you are uh, particularly looking for Pfizer, Moderna, whatever that may be. Um, do remember that not all providers yet have the Pfizer uh, pediatric formulation, the one for ages 5 to 11. Uh, I do expect to see the, that number of providers will certainly increase over the coming uh, days and weeks, but for the moment, it's a relatively limited distribution. Um, last week, JCPS also announced that they've partnered with Spear Diagnostics and that um, they will be providing vaccine clinics at four, uh, 24 schools across uh, the community in, um, in a week or so, November 13th and 14th. So um, there's a list of uh, sites there. Uh, Norton Healthcare is uh, the operator for most pediatric practices in the area, and uh, they have probably the largest supply of the pediatric version uh, at this juncture. So if you go to NortonHealthcare.com, you can um, schedule an appointment with them. And then uh, what you're seeing here is our um, Blue Vax Community Clinic listing, and um, we'll be showing the where you can find our vaccine clinic. Um, we have made several of these sites standing locations. So last night we were at um, Smoketown Family Wellness, and we'll be returning to that site on a regular basis, uh, Neighborhood House, Valley Neighborhood Place, um, and uh, the Shawnee Arts and Cultural Center are also um, standing sites that we'll be visiting on a regular rotation. Um, and if all that is uh, too much or you're confusing or need someone um, to help guide you, the helpline is still here at 912-8598. Uh, they can help people find a vaccine location, get them an appointment. They can help you uh, find a ride to your appointment if that's um, something that you need. So um, lots of options out there and I expect to see more options for uh, the pediatric group uh, in the days and weeks to come. So um, stay tuned for more on that. Uh, and then before we uh, go over to the media, I would uh, ask Connie Mendel to uh, just give us an update on the Say Yes to COVID test initiative. Sure, thank you. Um, so it, it's been extremely successful. Um, we're really excited to be able to offer the free COVID test kits, the at-home kits uh, to the public. So um, right now they're still available. Um, you can order online um, through Thursday. So this week, um, the last chance to get those will, um, will be Thursday and the link will close at midnight. Um, so far, um, we've had 80 partners join us from the communities, which has been fantastic. So they'll receive their last shipments this week, um, actually likely today, and they'll continue to hand those out um, until they run out. So we've got um, about 50 locations, and you can see the list here, that, um, that are providing these test kits to their clients and to the public. Um, so as long as they have them available, which is likely, you know, at least for the next week or two, depending on the demand. Um, at this time, um, over 134,000 of the at-home kits have been provided directly to the to residents by mail, so that's through the mail link. And our partners have received over 170,000 tests to distribute. Um, so this has just been, you know, a great program for the department and for the community. Um, and, I, and I just did want to touch on that it is really important. Um, testing is one of the, the pieces that's going to help that has helped us get through the pandemic. Um, while vaccinations obviously are super important, 
testing twice a week, regardless of symptoms, um, offers the best chance of identifying COVID-19 infection, and then um, subsequently isolating to reduce that spread into the community. So this is just one more way for us to keep the community healthy. Um, and just being able to screen at home um, and, you know, and um, in the privacy of your home is, is a great way um, to identify COVID if you're not feeling well um, and then take action. So stay home, um, you know, not go into school. And um, it's also great as you know, the Thanksgiving holidays are coming close, um, you know, testing at home before deciding to travel um, or joining the family for a large dinner, particularly if you've got people that are more susceptible to COVID. Um, and, uh, but I do want to remind folks that um, these, these tests, while they're great indicators, um, they don't replace testing policies and those required for travel, workplace, or school programs. Thank you, Connie. And that's absolutely right. Testing remains an important part of uh, mitigation for COVID. We uh, continue to lean on that Swiss cheese model where uh, we stack protections on top of each other so that uh, if something gets past one line of defense that we have uh, other things lined up to uh, help protect us. So um, staying up, avoiding crowds, wearing face coverings, hand hygiene, um, all important, and then testing and vaccination as well. Uh, and I particularly want to remind our adults in high risk groups. So if you're over age 65, if you live or work in a high risk high exposure setting, uh, or if you basically, if you have any medical condition that you see a doctor for or take medicine for, um, then you probably qualify for a booster. And I would encourage, especially those in high risk groups, to get uh, the boosters. Um, and then we continue to get first doses out um, slowly but surely to those uh, who have not yet received them. Um, so, Kathy, I will uh, hand it back to you and we can go to the questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hartledge, this first question is from Paul Miles of WHAS Radio to you. What do you attribute the return to the red category? Could Halloween activities has, have contributed to the increase? Do you believe this is just a short term spike in cases? Yeah, so, um, I think we were just barely out of the red um, a few days ago. So we've sort of been bouncing around right at that at that line for a little bit. Um, our incidence today is 31, so it's up a little bit. Um, we we know that there were some Halloween parties, that, so there could be some uh, contribution from those. We also are just now coming out of uh, fall break for uh, some of our school systems, so uh, some folks traveling maybe, um, and all those things can contribute to a rise in incidents. And it's just a great reminder for us that uh, even as we come um, sort of out of the Delta surge, that we can't let our our um, guard down. We need to continue with those. Uh, mitigation measures and protections as much as we can um, because we just don't know what's coming next. Great, thank you. Um, Paul's next question is, what is the health department's recommendation for Thanksgiving gatherings? But we also have two other outstanding medical professionals on. So um, I'll start with um, Tonya. So what are you telling any of your patients maybe to help them prepare for Thanksgiving gatherings? Well, start by, uh, I think the testing, you know, before a gathering is an excellent idea. Uh, we do have uh, free test kits that we are also offering here. Um, but uh, with, as far as my patients go, um, you know, hasn't, uh, we haven't really started talking too much about Thanksgiving yet, but my uh, recommendation would be, you know, to try and keep the gatherings um, small. And this is one of the reasons we would really encourage the parents to go ahead and vaccinate the children. Uh, the 5 to 11 to make sure that if they're around uh, other vulnerable um, family members that they are protected. Great. Thank you. Dr. Gaines, do you have anything to add? Uh, just a little. Um, earlier, when we were talking about the 5 year old that wanted the shot so he can take off the mask, um, I get a little nervous when I do hear that because we want to stay with the basics. You want to do this, the uh, safe distancing. You want to have your mask, wash your hands. Uh, and I think we should try to have a meal with people that have a similar vaccination picture. 
that means that I am have vaccinated guests. That would be my recommendation because you never know. And I wouldn't do too much traveling uh, from state to state to go to family dinners. I think I think we're the only way we're going to pull out of the pandemic is if we can control the spread of this disease. And if people are not vaccinated, uh, they we shouldn't have them crossing lines, even though, you know, I shouldn't have read the paper yesterday because the paper yesterday said that we're getting ready to open up the borders to, to people from other countries, but they have to have an FDA vaccine. And so people now are scrambling and now there's some question about are there vaccines that are not safe or were not effective? So I think we just need to keep following. Uh, we're still in a pandemic. People are still dying. And now children are a slightly protected group in that they don't tend to get as sick with it, but they can also get infected and transmit to their, their grandparents, et cetera. So I would keep the gathering small and I would hope that if I'm vaccinated, um, that I would invite people who are vaccinated into my home. But, you know, I don't know what's going through everybody's head these days. I don't know and why we can't follow, you know, recommendations uh, the way we should, safety precautions. So I hope we have a, uh, a safe Thanksgiving. Thank you, Dr. Gaines. Dr. Hartledge, do you wanna add anything? Uh, so I'll just echo what everyone else has said. The smaller gatherings are better. Uh, your loved ones that you know, uh, you know, you know them and you know what their vaccine um, profile is, you know they've been vaccinated, that's the safest, um, not 100%, nothing's 100%, but that's the safest measure you can take. If you are traveling, I recommend you get tested three to five days prior to your traveling and then, then again when you return. Is it up here? Okay. <clears throat> Um, I think Dr. Gaines, are you okay? Are you having any technical difficulties? You're muted, Dr. Gaines. Okay, she's okay. Okay, um, this next question is from Deb Yetter of the Career Journal. Governor Bashir yesterday mentioned a decline in testing. He said, um, that may be affecting the positivity rate. Have we seen that in Jefferson County? Um, Dr. Hartledge or Connie, either one of you so want to testing, address that? Testing is down somewhat, um, and that can impact the positivity rate. Positivity rate is dependent on the number of tests given. So um, that can be a, um, that can skew the positivity rate. Um, we tend to look more at the incidence rate than the positivity rate um, for reliable data. So um, the incidence rate is not dependent on the number of tests. Uh, but in particular, we're seeing people, most people who are getting tested are either doing it for a travel restriction or because they're symptomatic. And when you're only testing symptomatic people, uh, you're going to see a different positivity rate than when we were doing uh, widespread screening testing. So a lot of uh, a lot of the screening tests, asymptomatic screening tests, um, have gone by the wayside, and that that can skew your positivity rate. Okay, thank you. This next question is from Bria Jones of WFPL. Are you anticipating any testing kits being left over following the last day for ordering and last delivery for pickup? If so, uh, what do we plan to do with the remaining unclaimed kits? Connie, you want to take that one? Sure. So um, the test kits going out this week are intended to be distributed this week and next. Um, and then anyone that's ordering those again through Thursday, they have four weeks worth of tests coming to their home. So um, the program was created to extend forward, you know, at least another four weeks for testing to increase testing in the community over the next four weeks. So the majority of these um, are in the hands of our partners and, um, you know, they will continue to um, hand those out to their clients, um, patients, or, or anyone in the public. So we'll keep our website active um, as long as someone has kits available to distribute, their name will um, remain on the website as they run out. We'll remove those locations, 
and um, and hopefully they'll all be used, which is which is the intent. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is also from Bria Jones, WFPL. With the work vaccine mandates coming up, has the city seen an increase in requests for the J and J vaccine for those who waited to get their vaccinations? Um, Dr. Hartledge, do we have any? I don't know. If we have any data on that, or have you seen an increase in requests? No, there's not been an increase in at least for our our sites. We've not seen an increase in requests for. Um, the Janssen or Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Uh, in general, the most specific requests we get are for Pfizer because it has the largest age range. Uh, I've not seen a whole lot of J and J being administered recently. I, I don't think we've given any reason. Okay, thank you. And then this uh, next question is from Deb Yetter, the CJ, to everyone. Do we know anything about availability of test kits in stores? They seem to be scarcer. Wondered how easily available they are. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hortledge or Connie, but we are not really monitoring the availability of test kits in stores. So I don't know that we have an answer for that. Yeah, I don't have a specific answer for that. Like you said, we don't monitor it, but um, there have been intermittent um, supply shortages and scarcity manufacturing issues that do impact the supply chain for testing. Um, so it, it tends to come in waves um, where they'll be stacked up behind the counter and then sometimes you can't find one at all. So uh, we don't want to that, but they are certainly subject to supply line um, issues that impact the rest of the COVID response. And I, I will say that that was um, the reasoning behind the say yes to COVID test as we were, as our case counts were skyrocketing, you know, as we were um, seeing the Delta variant spread rapidly through the community, there were a lot of areas where, um, whether it be an at-home test kit or even um, the, the testing facilities and uh, testing options, there were delays. Um, I know some were having as much as you know three or four days to schedule an appointment. So that's why the um, CDC and NIH reached out to us for this program. And the ones that are available with say yes to COVID tester are the same ones that are um, sold at a lot of the local pharmacies. <coughs> Thank you, Connie. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gaines. Thank you, Tonya, for joining us. Um, thank you to our media colleagues for joining us. That's it for today. We will see you again um, in two weeks. Thanks.